Hello and welcome to um, video number 11 in my Elements of Painting uh, video series. Um, <clears throat> thanks for coming back and um, hope you enjoyed the previous videos. Let's get straight to my slideshow. So I'll do a share screen here. And we are at Aerial Perspective, even though it's spelt wrong. I guess I mistyped that. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this is about uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, another uh, element of, uh, of painting, um, the arrow perspective. Uh, An arrow perspective is the effect of, of color and saturation changing as things recede in the distance for landscape artists, but also for uh, 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 you know, other artists, I've seen aerial perspective of a kind being used in uh, still life, where artists have exaggerated the distance between objects by adding a little bit of a, an aerial perspective effect uh, uh, to create depth of field. Uh, this is Maxfield Parish, which I should have noted in my misspelt uh, title here. Um, <clears throat> aerial uh, Maxfield Parish. Fair, Parish was somebody that exaggerated a lot uh, with aerial perspective. Uh, I think it, it's interesting that this painting about aerial perspective, uh, or <clears throat> looking at a uh, physical perspective, that's that's actually a little off. Because uh, I mean, if if this is the horizon up here, which tends to be where water meets land, uh, it's actually above the perspective of the object or the characters here so so this character is below the surface uh and you can tell too from the the curvature of the arc on this co uh, column that uh, we're looking fairly flatly across it so you know the horizon has got to be somewhere here but he's got it up here so he's cheated and played with that with that effect which is kind of fun actually because you get little spots where you know this character is is breaking that horizontal line and this knee again is breaking that horizontal line so there's a surreal kind of tone to it and that's a, certainly a surreal visual uh image uh and there's uh you know the water is fairly flat but there's no reflection of any of the the subject in it uh i, I assume it's water it may not be uh, but uh, anyway, this is supposed to be about error perspective, and error perspective is the as as objects recede into the distance, they lose their what they call um, uh, they lose their 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 color, whatever color they are. If it's a a, a a mountain covered with green trees, the green fades and disappears into uh blues and purples and uh and getting good air perspective actually takes some study uh there's uh, quite often depending on where you are there's a lot of magenta uh and it's interesting if you look at landscape artists from australia uh their aerial perspective because of the temperature of the light and the the subject and and the geographic location their aerial perspective is quite dramatically different from North America. And um, <clears throat> my father and I, you know, over the years, we did a lot of traveling and painting, taking groups to various different places. And uh, and his natural sense of color, and he didn't do it on purpose. Uh, he didn't, there was no um, conscious choice to, to change the colors. But when he went to the Mediterranean, when he was painting uh, paintings in greece uh or or uh the amalfi coast or something like that the colors the inherent colors shifted from a palette of north america to uh a, a, a mediterranean palette so in various different places around the world where the atmosphere is different and the landscape is different uh the reflection uh, the, the aerial perspective is different and uh it's really quite an interesting effect i can tell not just from the the style of boat that he's painting because he was a marine artist but i could tell uh where he was in the world based on 
on the color saturation of the water in the Mediterranean, it was a lot more of a sapphire blue, uh, you know. Uh, so <clears throat> anyway, aero perspective, uh, study it and and uh, and and learn it, and then you can play with it like Maxville Parish has done here. This this uh, mountain in the background is not that far back from this mountain because you can still see some definition of detail in it, but you're getting a real sense of haze, almost like uh, this, there's an atmosphere of, of smoke or something in the air that that uh, pushes it back and 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 you lose the magentas of, of the shadows here and it turns to more of a blue, which is more like the sky color. So something fun to, to, to learn about and, and, and incorporate in your work. So that's aerial perspective. Cast shadows are always a big one. Um, this little painting I did, we used to have this, um, uh, we still do actually, a, a thing called the Oak Bay Tea Party in Victoria <clears throat> because it has a lot of British heritage. Uh, Oak Bay is, is considered a little kind of British and, and they have this big celebration every year called the Tea Party. And at the Tea Party, kids come and line the streets. It's a parade, it starts with a parade and uh, vintage vehicles drive down the road and they throw candy out on the road and kids run out in front of Model Ts that have no brakes and things and they pick up candy and I'm going like, oh my God, they're gonna run them over. But uh, so far they haven't. But um, in this particular painting, you can see that we've got, you know, definitely some, some uh, strong uh, uh, cast shadows. Uh, cast shadows, really uh, uh create a sense of depth of field and and quite often actually i'm surprised uh i see that uh artists that are painting still life struggle with cast shadows because quite often in a still life setting you've got you know objects arranged on some kind of table you've got a a, a synthetic light source not a sunlight most often and uh and so the the shadows are not pronounced and uh, and it really loses a lot of depth of field because uh the cast shadows aren't aren't strong and and so i'm, I'm a big believer that that uh strong cast shadows are are important so and you can play with them too uh uh like uh once you get to know how a shadow works and what color it is and stuff you can create shadows. And one of the most recent paintings I did, I'm, I should have put it in a slideshow, but I didn't, or it is, but it's in an, uh, later on. So I'll, I'll point it out to you where I wanted to take a, a character and I was doing a, uh, a, a Botticelli Venus, uh, kind of spin off. So I have this character standing in a, a scallop shell and I, of course, easy to find a scallop shell character I had, but, you know how do they interact in terms of the cast shadow how does the shadow form on the on the shell where the shadow is close to the object <clears throat> it's quite a defined line as the shadow falls away from what's casting it it becomes softer so it, it goes out of focus and uh it's not so pre uh, 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 not so um obvious here in this particular painting because it's kind of a more of a sketchy type of painting but but knowing the mechanics of a shadow uh you can i uh, what i wound up doing was was generating this shadow that was cast off this figure onto this uh onto the scallop shell and uh i was able to synthesize what that would look like in a realistic painting because i painted shadows for a long time and I, I'm, I understand how to generate them and and make them so that they are the right color and they they fade on the edges as they as they recede uh away from the the uh, object that's casting them so so again one of those things where once you know how light and how cast shadows work you can you can create them you can exaggerate them you can uh, add them, especially if you're taking multiple images and combining them together. And, and you know, if, if there's cast shadows there's, there, on other things, it's got to be cast shadows in the right place or else it's going to look funny. So 
<clears throat> that's a, another good thing, uh, a good element to to understand so you can work with it. This is uh, Brad Kunkel. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing his name right. I always pronounce it Kunkel, but uh, repetition of form and pattern. Uh, you know, these are, are uh, uh, hurl from peacocks, uh, peacock eye, hurl, hurl eyes, whatever you call them. Uh, so, uh, you know, repetition of, of form and pattern. There are some people that uh, I know that do um, foil. This, again, is silver foil in the background of the painting. I've seen people work in gold foil where they, they start to create drawn patterns in the foil. Uh, so patterns and, and, and repeating objects... Uh, can be a fun thing to to consider and maybe apply. Obviously, it's a big part of this painting, but it doesn't have to be uh, such a dominant part of a painting. Uh, on to the next one. Highlights, of course. Well, that's a pretty obvious one. Highlights are an important part of any painting. They draw uh, attention to the focal areas. Uh, you want to have the highlights in the focal areas most of the time. Uh, the brightest highlights in the in the in the image. Uh, they're not necessarily in this one. I mean, I could have I could have watered these highlights down in the water here. Excuse the pun, but uh, um, they're they're kind of part of of this effect of the sunlight shining down on. Uh, this is Erica, one of the uh, girls in my uh, Siren series, and. Uh, you know, she's uh, in the in the story. She's holding vigil, uh, waiting for her sister to return, um, and uh, and that's the the storyline in this. And there you can see some of this uh, sp sp spiral pattern in the fabric that I, I've referred to in previous videos, uh, which wound up working its way into <clears throat> being a part of the storyline uh, of of the book. So that's obviously important obviously important to know how to manipulate them and play with them and maximize them. So good thing to know. Uh, brush jokes. So I happen to, <laughs> I uh, spent 25 years as an airbrush illustrator where you're trying not to create brush jokes. So I am kind of uh, brush stroke disabled. Uh, I, I, I need to learn more, work more with brush strokes, but I have this, this, thing about about blending them away I, I it's just something i do and you know I'm, I'm fighting it to this day uh but you can see here uh the the brush strokes that jeremy mann who's a master of this uh this type of work how loose this work is how brush strokey it is and then how tight the rendering is and and because it's so loose here it makes the rendering in the full point really look tight even though it's not that tight not in terms of photorealism it, but it is obviously the focal point of this painting and uh, and the brush strokes create this great implied texture and implied objects in the background that create mystery here's another example of of a, a color scheme that's quite surreal this is not flesh tone so you know a lot of this greeny kind of color is affecting the uh or affecting the the skin tone you know the face itself is quite green uh so um <clears throat> yeah really great stuff uh so brush strokes certainly are are something that a lot of artists use i mean think of um uh van gogh uh you know i mean his brush strokes are what makes his work famous uh, you know you look at starry sky or something like that and 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 or starry night and there's you know, brush strokes all around the the sun and the moon and stuff in his painting. So, so his stuff, his brush strokes became a signature of his work, and and uh, that's quite a quite a clear one that that makes a a Van Gogh a Van Gogh. So, brush strokes are important to to work with. And then you know, uh, this is Maxfield Parrish again. Uh, inspiration from other people. Uh, I have long had the uh, opinion that um, that your style comes from the things that you see in in day to day life when you're out walking or out sailing or 
whatever it is you're doing and you're absorbing this material and it's all becoming a resource uh, a bank for you to draw on. But then also not just the things that you've experienced, but the things that you've seen other people do. And, you know, if you're working on a landscape that has trees in it and <clears throat> you happen to think back to, oh, I remember how, you know, so-and-so handled the abstraction of trees. You didn't have to paint every branch or leaf. Uh, <clears throat> you know, all those things add together. You take a bit of this from here and a bit of that from there and you mush it all together and that becomes you. That becomes your style and it's based on the influences you've had over your life which means that they are entirely unique to you because nobody else was standing beside you the whole time uh you're uh, in your life and if they were they weren't looking necessarily in the same direction or or recognizing certain things so style becomes an entirely individual and uh and that's based on on your experience and so getting some inspiration from peers uh, I, um, when I, when I was doing watercolor, I think I mentioned this in a previous video, I used to, uh, uh, uh always look at, uh, Andrew Wyatt, uh, uh, go through his books before I started painting just to get myself in the right frame of mind, uh, and in a bold frame of mind. So I could feel comfortable in taking these big swaths of color and washes and, and the contrasts that, that, uh, that he used and, and uh, which is boldness. And, you know, the thing about boldness is that um, when you have boldness in a painting, the viewer is going to see that boldness and that bravery and 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 breathe it in. So so the the, the boldness of attack uh, becomes uh, a big part of what makes a painting work. And um, anyway, uh, look at some some peers and and some books and and find the people that inspire you and and uh and you can sample bits and pieces here and there from from what they do and and add that to your repertoire of, of uh painting i think we're getting close here haha <laughs> there we go andrew wyeth again same thing uh key this is a, a piece of mine that uh was painted in a very high key uh, uh in the storyline uh it's right after a big snowfall and storm uh called this is called three little birds and in the in the book the cabin that they're living in uh is called three little birds because of these birds and and the story has a lot of uh of connection to um the song uh three little birds um uh, bob marley and um yeah it, it's all mixed in there through the the storyline too so uh anyway key you know quite often when i'm working on something i'll um i'll, I'll be playing around with it on on the computer playing around doing some different color variations and trying different things and and uh sometimes i'll i'll just blast the whole thing out and wash it out and have a look at it and go whoa what would it be like to to paint this in a really high key uh and then i'll play around and drop it down and have it in very low key and and so you know these are all little things you can play with and and you might be surprised at something that you hadn't considered that would work in, in a high key format um <clears throat> when you when you play around with it you try it out or you think about it uh it might change your mind so good thing to 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 play with and another uh tool to 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 uh to use so key uh metal leaf uh i haven't really talked much about metal leaf one of the problems with metal leaf uh <clears throat> this is all a uh, silver metal leaf on a small painting this is a little eight by ten painting so i've got silver metal leaf in the background i like i like metal leaf when it's in small pieces i haven't done any that are large uh but uh metal leaf on on small paintings i've done a number of uh there are lots of different types of metal leaf available it's fairly easy to work with uh it takes some experimentation um if you 
use there there's some copper and there's some mock gold which means that uh it's a kind of a, a a pseudo gold that looks like gold when you put it on but it oxidizes and uh changes over time and uh you can buy real 24 karat gold but it's expensive and a book of 24 karat gold i remember i went into an art store once and i i i took some gold leaf off the off the counter off the display cabinet and and I was just playing around, so I didn't want real gold. I wanted metal leaf uh, that was mock gold. And I did the counter, they rang it up. It was like 800 bucks. I'm like, what? And uh, and he said, well, you got three packs of 24 karat gold there. And I went, oh, well, they're right on the counter because they keep the <laughs> keep the 24 karat gold behind the counter in a glass case. And one of the one of the salespeople had accidentally put real gold out on the on the floor and and it was quite funny so anyway i opted not to buy the real gold but uh be aware that if you're using metal leaf uh the the mock stuff can oxidize and uh it's another thing about it too is that it, it's difficult to photograph uh so when you're photographing it it looks kind of like gray so when you're copy standing your work and trying to record it for future use or if you're going to publish it in a book or make a print of it uh, gold leaf is not very photographic friendly or any kind of leaf is not very photographic friendly but it's a nice kind of effect here's a little bit of gold leaf in here there's some some more gold effects again this is a little 10 by 10 uh, painting playing with gold leaf this is brad gunkel again and there's that silver uh background that he uses and that abstracted a uh, uh, local color that he's played with to create a certain mood. Uh, Brad does a lot of metallic uh, uh, application on his work. Nice stuff. And Brian Johnson. Uh, I'm not quite sure what this was about. <laughs> I think this is out of out of order. This was supposed to be in the uh, transitional uh, areas. Uh, section of, of maybe the last video but uh let's just go over this uh brian used to love to do uh a really uh exquisite draft drafting and exquisite drawing and painting in small areas and then have this loose washy texture that would lose edges and these these lost edges undefined edges create a lot of visual interest in the painting and uh, and stimulate the viewer. So that's sorry, that's a little bit out of order. I don't know how that got there, but anyway, it's always good to to look at a Brian Johnson painting. They're inspirational. Foreshortening certainly something that that happens. A lot of people fight with it, and uh, uh, you know, don't have a lot of fun with it uh, because it's it's difficult to 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 create foreshortening effect. Um, it, it's a it's a tough one to draw. But uh, but it can be useful uh, in this instance, you know, it created uh, some depth field uh, and this hand coming off the edge here uh, creates kind of an interesting tension. Uh, so foreshortening is something that uh, that can be used in the right uh, application and uh, and and can be used to advantage. So foreshortening is something I think we're getting close to the end here. Um, I think that's probably time now for this video. Uh, I don't know how much more. Oh, there's only a little bit more to go. We'll do one more video. Uh, so this is the end of video number 11. Uh, when we come back, let me get rid of this. When we come back, we'll be doing uh, probably the last video in the series, video number 12. And uh, and that'll be the, the final um, uh, points I wanted to make in, in the Elements of Painting series. I hope that you found it uh, interesting and uh, maybe can take some of that uh, thinking and some of these elements and apply it to your, your own work. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thanks for joining me and uh, take care.